Hello and welcome back to our final video on corals, where we will be looking at what corals look like in a rock, a quick glimpse of what they look like in a slide, and then a couple of slides on why they are useful to us as geologists. So let's start with the first of these, and let's have a look at some corals in a rock. And here you can see some corals in a rock. So actually, um, I have, in my experience, found corals relatively easy to recognize in rocks. They're often quite chunky, especially in the Paleozoic, where you have these robust rugose forms or um, tabulate corals that tend to form chunky um, colonies. And as such, they're relatively easy to identify if they're not highly fragmented. On the left here, you can see an example of some solitary rugose corals. These are actually in a limestone in the Devonian of Ohio, USA. Um, it's part of a widespread sheet of Devonian carbonates that extends from New York State all the way through to the Midwest. And you can see that in your typical rock, you have corals cut at multiple angles, allowing you usually to see both the scepter that you can see here, and indeed the tabulae when you see them in cross section. So that allows us to kind of assess what kind of coral that we're looking at. And of course, in, in this Paleozoic rock, we know there was only one form of solitary coral, and that's the Rugosa. So that will help you identify that group there. In the middle, you can see an example here of a fossil coral in a dollar stone from this Silurian of Ohio in the USA. And you can see that when we break open the rock, we can see the sec in section um, that this is not only a colonial coral, but that it has very, very well-developed tabulae. All of these horizontal lines that you can see here are the tabulae. I imagine if we look down at it from above, we'd see poorly developed septa. And that tells us that this is a um, member of the tabulate corals. Um, of course, if we are looking at more recent rocks, we could well find fossil corals, and those will probably be sclerectinian in nature. And you see an example of a fossil sclerectinian uh, coral from the Cenozoic of Florida in the USA on the right hand side here. And these are relatively easy to identify because as I finished the last video by saying, they tend to have this fairly um, delicate um, skeleton to them, certainly compared to these chunky forms that we find in the Paleozoic. So that's really, really helpful in identifying sclerotinian clock corals. I wanted to highlight though, that there are some forms of clock coral which are a bit harder to recognize until you've seen a couple of them. After that, it's relatively straightforward. Um, you can see a, a couple on this slide. Uh, that on the left is a tabulate coral. It's actually called Oleopora, and it's attached to a brachiopod. It's from the middle Devonian of um, uh, Mil the Milwaukee Formation in Wisconsin. And this is an example of an encrusting form. So you can see a coral here um, encrusting upon a brachiopod. And this is a typical tubular branching form that you some see in some tabulate coral groups. So if you say, ever see this in the rock record and you don't know what it is, it may well be an example of these slightly weird, unexpected tabulate fossils. The example on the right is a member of, a, uh, of the genus Halicytes, and this is from the Silurian of Ohio, and these are colloquially called, colloquially called chain fossils for obvious reasons. When you see these colonies, they look a lot like they're forming chains in the rock. And again, if you've not seen one of those, you may not immediately jump to thinking that as a coral, but actually that's fairly typical of these early to mid Paleozoic rocks. So those are two forms of slightly um, unusual morphology within the corals. I also wanted to highlight that corals are often found in association with reef environments, as we've already discussed. And in reefs, you can typically divide any given reef into a distinct number of sub-environments. And this is true in varying degrees, admittedly, but throughout the fossil record. Um, what I'm going to highlight is based on our understanding of modern coral reefs, but it will be true um, at least throughout the Mesozoic. Obviously, there will be local changes to this pattern within Paleozoic rocks, so that will require a bit more reading on your part if you are ever in a situation to try and understand that. So the reef crest is the site of growth of the corals that build the most robust structures within our reef. These tend to be encrusting and massive forms which are capable of withstanding that force of waves bashing against them day in, day out in very shallow waters. 
behind the um, reef crest is a thing called the reef flat. This also has to um, comprise relatively robust forms, um, but conditions go become quieter the further you move back towards the uh, reef flat. And when you get um, slightly quieter conditions, you tend to get globular coral forms. So these tend to be rounded and bulbous, much shaped much like a globe. If you get deeper in front of the reef, on the reef front, um, the really robust uh, massive corals that you get here are often replaced by branching or more delicate plate-like forms because you have lower energy deep water in this position on a coral. And obviously you get break breakup of materials in the reef core by wave and storm action. So this means that you get a, um, a teleslope that you can see marked here of debris from the uh, reef that builds up out to sea. So this four reef setting, which is uh, where the teleslope is found, tends to be a region of accumulation of, a, of carbonate breccias. So those will often form what we call bioclastic rudstones and grainstone fasces. You'll be learning about those or in fact, by this point may have already done so, depending on the order in which we um, deliver these lectures um, with uh, Rodri. The back reef is sheltered from the highest energy conditions. And as such, you can, um, it forms a site of deposition for debris that's been removed from the reef core and washed towards the lagoon, but also um, fine grain material that can settle out in those quieter conditions. As such, when you find fossils associated with reefs, not only can you tell roughly where you are on the reef by the form of the fossil core, but you will often be able to tell you where you are by the level of fragmentation and the grain size of and the grain arrangement of the rock that you're looking at. So just be aware that reefs are this relatively common ecosystem um, in the geological record and that we can tell quite a lot about rocks that have been deposited in a reef type setting. So if you're looking at these in section once more, um, they tend to be relatively well preserved. So it's not too tricky to be able to identify the different forms of coral in section. It may help you to remember if you're ever looking at um, a thin section that sclerotinia tend to be aragonite and the other groups are calcite. And typically um, you'll be getting uh, different uh, corals that are being cut at different angles and this allows you to assess the relative um, uh, dominance of the uh, tabulae versus the septae and thus hopefully identify what kind of coral you may, may be looking at again in Paleozoic rocks, uh, Mesozoic and Younger uh, not, not, so, um, not so necessary to tell them apart so you can see some nice examples of um, Paleozoic slides here and these corals really jump out of the rock at you and that matches my experience of seeing these in the field they're normally relatively um, straightforward to spot so i wanted to finish today's lecture by highlighting why corals are useful to us as geologists i would highlight first that corals are of some utility in biostratigraphy but due to the fact that they aren't always widespread that's generally within localized regions. You don't really have the ability in that many time periods to say anything about global distribution of fossil corals. We do know today that coral reefs are situated primarily in tropical seas, up to 30 to five degrees latitude either side of the equator. And we can also say that in modern corals, uh, this is due to their symbiotic algae. Um, modern corals essentially need to be found if they have these algae in the photic zone um, and they like agitated, oxygenated, shallow water. So if we find a nice chunky reef system in the fossil record, it's tempting to assume um, that whenever we see such a reef ecosystem, that the environment of deposition was this situation where you have warm tropical waters lots and lots of um, activity relatively little sediment input all of these um, different conditions that modern corals like and it must be said while i said it's tempting this does work to an extent as long as we're looking at corals so sclerotinian corals that have this symbiotic relationship we're on safe ground by saying if we find a reef system of colonial corals that it may well be representing the shallow water uh, photic zone environments. This image here is a fine example. It's a sclerotinian fossil um, 
uh, it's actually a brain coral from the uh, Windley Key Fossil Reef Geological State Park in Florida. So this is a nice example of where you'd be able to say, okay, we can say something about the conditions this rock was deposited in because of the fossil um, corals that we find in it. But we need to remember also that other reef builders live in different environments. So if your coral, if your reef is not made of coral, all bets are off. You can't really say that much about it. Um, as an example, in modern seas, we have coralline algae that build reefs at high latitudes. And indeed, if we go deep into the geological record, we don't know the environmental tolerances or extinct corals fully. People are arguing about the nature of their growth and whether they had these um, symbiotic algae. So if we're going back to pre-Mesozoic groups, such as the Rugos and the tabulate corals, where we don't know about this symbiotic relationship, we have to rein that inclination to use fossils in, so to use fossil corals as a paleoenvironmental indicator in a little bit, based on the fact that we don't know these tolerances. The older a rock gets, I would advise you to be uh, more and more cautious when using the uh, fossils in it, and especially the corals in it, to say something about its environment of deposition. So fossil corals are, with some caveats, good paleoenvironmental indicators. I wanted to finish this little video by highlighting some really cool questions that we can get at using corals. And I dug out a really cool example for, for you that's based on the high resolution study of Devonian horn corals, such as the ones that you can see on this lovely image here that are actually from Ontario, in Ontario, I should say, in Canada. So well-preserved corals of, uh, of this kind, these are rugos corals, display fine growth lines, those are rugae. And those are often thick, uh, developed together into thicker bands. The growth lines reflect daily growth, so that the, the coral adds a little bit to its skeleton each day, whereas the thicker bands are monthly growth cycles, which are controlled by the lunar orbit. Yet more widely spaced bands may represent yearly growth. Detailed analysis of these growth bands on coral epithecae on a variety of Devonian fossils, such as the ones shown on this slide, has been used to demonstrate that the Devonian year had about 400 days in it. So the implication here is that Devonian days were shorter. You can ram more days into a month, so you have more of these individual growth lines within one of your monthly packages. And all of this shows, using uh, Devonian corals, that the Earth's rate of rotation is decreasing due to the gravitational pull of the Moon. So from corals and from studying corals, we know that days on Earth have gotten longer. Isn't that cool? That's so cool. That's really cool. And in fact, using similar approaches, um, more recent papers have also uh, used growth patterns to show on fossil corals to measure ancient Earth-Sun distances. So just by looking at the external of these really cool fossils, we can say something fairly fundamental about the way um, the Earth and its cycles are changing through time. So that's really, really neat, and I rather like it. So with that, I will, uh, I will leave you for the corals, and I will leave you to explore the rest of the website to cover a tiny bit more about these um, exciting animals. I'll see you soon.